<laughs> Thanks for coming to the Lightroom. The main thing about the Lightroom uh, is that we don't want to talk about tech. We actually want to talk about the art of lighting. And uh, it's a huge pleasure to have uh, Dick Pope here. And uh, I'm a gaffer. He's a cinematographer. We don't know each other. So that happens all the time to me on the set. So I'll try to get into his mind as fast as I can to help out. But uh, we kept the event small, so you guys all can come in and ask questions as well, because I'm sure uh, that's a lot of stuff in your mind when you think about this work. Uh, this work. Yeah, thanks. All right. Let's sit down. So I'll just start off with the first question. Uh, when I start working with the DP, it's always Everybody is sure that the way they work is the only way that we can work. So I, what I try to do is, is I try to get in their head. And, and the first question would be, is that when you when you light a scene, wh where do you look for light? What's what's the interesting thing for you where you say you like that? <laughs> is there a re re sharing one? This is not to speak. Yeah. Not this for yeah. the video. Yeah. What's this to record? This yeah. for the video. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. So that's so, for the room, that's for the video. What's the matter with your neck? Uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> or is it a, a way to hold it steady? It's just a way to hold it steady. It keeps the camera more steady. It's like it's a gimbal. It's like a gimbal. It is a gimbal. Yeah, it is a gimbal. A head gimbal. Built in head gimbal. It works, it I'm works sorry, great. I didn't mean to... I didn't, I didn't mean to upset her. No, 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 I'm not upset. It's funny. You know, you've got a broken neck and that's it. Yeah, I'm dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should be lying in a hospital bed, but you're here doing oh, come on. sticking that thing in my face. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Um, I don't know really how to answer that. The thing, the thing is that I've read the script, if there is a script, and it's not someone like Mike Lee without one, but I, I, I've read the script, and in, in my mind's eye, well, through the director's um, collabor the d collaboration with the director, I have um, hopefully a pretty good idea of how I see the film in my mind's eye. And, um, you know, I, I, I'll get that from reading the script. As I read a script, I'm, I'm looking at it at, as a film. And uh, the, the light. Um, and what one does with the light on any given scene is kind of a sidebar to the overall um, homogenous whole of the of the entire film. So I'm looking at it, I, and I'm looking at a, um, how it should be in, in my head because it's always described as interior, whatever, blah blah blah, exterior, blah, 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 and then you read and you read and you, you get this sort of feeling for it as a as a whole, and so. So it's quite difficult. It, it's dangerous, this, but it, I can't help but do it. It's dangerous because later on it might be that things don't go according to plan and you can't um, uh, create the images like you've first seen them. But I must say, if I get my own way and, um, and I'm always there to uh, try and get my own way, to try and make it run my way, um, as a DP um, for the best look then, but that is not always the case but then I'll go to a location say and um, and, and look at the light and um, so how it, it well it, it so depends whether you're in a studio or out on location they're very different animals studio and location in the studio you can you start off with a dark uh, black um, set and you uh, create the mood completely and utterly with light but a lot of the, a lot of the filming I do is on location and um, and then of course you're ruled by um, the weather outside looking out of windows or not looking out of windows if the view is wrong then you've got to deal with it it might be that it has to be blue screen outside and then a, a mat or plates put on later because the view is completely wrong. We had quite a lot of that on Mothers Brooklyn. And um, great rooms, fantastic big rooms and uh, 
perfect rooms, but the view outside might not be appropriate. Like it might be that it should be a rural landscape outside, but you're in a city. But whatever. So you have to be very adaptable, and um, and then it comes down to looking at um, looking at the uh, <laughs> the scene that you have to film, and uh, you know talking to the director there. I always do that. Always, you know, a director and myself will stand on a location. And he will tell me, you know, he will give me all his ideas about where the, what the actor should be doing as much as possible, you know, without seeing the actors doing it. Uh, and um, I'll be looking at it thinking, uh, if I bring the light in from here or there, or don't bring the light in, a night interior, night, day interior, whatever, to create the mood of the environment you're in, it, on a real location, that's really critical. You can't really, I don't think you can really talk about um, generalities here because every location has its own uh, challenges and list of parameters. So it's very variable. But whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to keep the look and mood of the film uh, as a whole, as a whole thing. So uh, my ideas for how I'd light it are driven by the whole, not just pretty pictures, pretty pictures on this scene, pretty pictures on that scene, is to tell the story yeah. and hopefully to make it as one yeah. cinematic experience. Between first time reading it and then saying, getting more detailed information, do you create an arc? Do you try to build some kind of into the storyline, something where you work with the light for that? Yes, I would say so. I would say so. That That's probably a good way of describing it. But that arc that I'm building, in here might not be the same as um, as you confront uh, with the director when you're at you know hopefully we're we're um, t director DP we're thinking along the same lines but that's not always the case and um, and then he, there can be a, a clash of uh, interest a clash of ideas um, and um, perhaps um, a little bit of locking horns about it you know about uh, I think it should be, and I think, but that's quite rare. That's quite rare. All I'd say is that I'm looking at a number of different things on any given scene, like for instance, protecting the look of, of an actress. Really important now. I never, ever, uh, I, I, and I won't um, just be quiet about it, if I think the actress is being put into a, um, a situation where um, they've got a uh, I put it in the wrong pocket. No. If I think, um, I'll make up. <laughs> if I think the actress has got jagged light, jagged light on her like this, um, I, and say that's a window, and say that's a real window, and um, the, the director and the actors are, are looking at her, her being here, where I am. And, and, and as an alternative, it, there's a possibility that I can see where that actress is, um, sorry, Jakob, that actress is here delivering, say the window light is coming in, like that on her. So I have a choice of like, um, her here, like that say, or, or over here, I'll be really um, trying to um, get it my way so that she's here and got full light. It all depends, you know. I mean, it depends what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to say. If I'm trying to make uh, an actress older and um, not be so kind on the light, then perhaps there's all right. But if it, if it's not that, then here's going to always be better. Or here against it. So that's quite good then, because you've got a nice... This is kind of an example of how it could be. Where you've got flat, a flat low light um, coming in on her and a backlight from the window. Say if it is a window in a real location, um, it's got to be better than anything that is like this. So I'm, if I see staging um, against windows where she has jagged light, I'm in there. I'm in there saying my piece, um, trying to um, 
because no one's going to like it. They might like it on the day. They think, oh, no, I should be here. But I, I'm in there saying, well, don't you think we should try it here? Like this. And invariably, um, when that happens, things start to come together and it works much better for everybody concerned. And there's no unhappiness afterwards because they're not looking at it on the day. Actors, they're just thinking about their performance and how they want to stage it. But if I'm there as a guiding light, and the director really is talking about stuff like that, he's talking about their performances, it's me, it's my job there to, um, to try and swing things so that everybody afterwards, including myself, is going to be happy with the results. So um, let's just take that, exa that example. So you pre lit the scene, and then the staging starts. Yeah. Are you trying to do everything as possible with the staging? Or are you then at that point saying, okay, we really have to be here, let's try to move the light around and even change some stuff? Well, if, there are, if it's a real location and there are windows involved, you can't do that. Um, and, uh, you know, that has to be a stage where you're doing that. They're quite, of, quite often, on, I find on location filming, I only really tr go so far with the lighting before I see the scene. It, it, it's not a question, you know, filmmaking is not a question of walking into a room and going boom like that, as you well know, and saying, okay, we're ready. And um, great, as, as long as it's right. It's great to be ready so fast and you've got it all pre-lit. But then, but then you're not really watching the actors and, and, um, and, and bouncing off what they're doing. So you can only go so far, and when you see the actors acting it, um, and say a really dramatic scene, uh, with a, a very intense, you have to really see it to, um, to be able to really know what you're doing in lighting. Just to answer a general question, but in terms of the relighting time, from the time you see the staging, to the time you get to the point where you light, it's like you try to plan it ahead of time, you've got this half an hour, whatever it takes, or is that some speedy process for you? Um, now that really, it, that really depends on, um, on the scene in hand. If the scene's very simple, it might be half an hour, but uh, it's a very good thing to, on the call time, say, to get into specifics, on the call time. Now the actors might have already done it with the director. You might have a heads up anyway about how it's going to be. And you might have seen this scene played out the day before. It just depends. But I would say that, say you, say we're going into a fresh location, it's a new scene, and the call time is eight o'clock in the morning. I'll always fight for the actors to come to the set and let's let's work out with the director what we're doing. So we do it, you do a, a director's rehearsal, which I always sit in on and watch quietly without, you know, without um, sticking my um, thoughts in. Wait until that's over. And then I'm, I might say, well, yeah, it's great. What do you think, Dick? Well, I, I think, wonderful, yeah. It's just that if you just, let's see if we can bring her over here and then man, we, and the actors, <laughs> if they think they're gonna look better, they're very enthusiastic. <laughs> um, it is my, um, it's my experience. If they think it's gonna work for them, then, um, it's going to work for all of us. So then they can go off and do um, hair um, and makeup and costume after they've been to that and gives me the time and takes the heat and pressure off me. Whereas if they come to the set all ready to go, you're, it, it, you're on a losing wicket really because they're all waiting there. Unless it is someone like Mike Lee who would immediately, he'll ask me, um, uh, well, the difference is because um, there is no script, and I see it um, on the day as a new scene with everybody else um, on the crew. We all see it together, so I don't see it in advance. So I haven't been able to light it, basically, on his films. I wait until I see the scene, and then he'll say, how long? And I, I might say two hours, I might say half a day, um, if, it's, if it's big. And uh, then he will go off with the actors and rehearse them and bring them really to the, um, the point of shooting. He'll do that in another place, um, a kind of safe house where he'll, he'll, he'll bring it to the fore. And then when I'm ready, he'll come back on and, 
and we basically um, think, rehearse and shoot. That's quite different to a lot of the way a lot of other people work. Where does the staging go in there? Do you do it after the rehearsal? <coughs> Uh, the, the staging of it. You see the rehearsal and then uh, but, where the uh, cameras will go. Yeah. What happens is, um, it's, it's well documented this about how he works, but after we all see the scene, um, uh, we, uh, the whole company sees it, um, then um, everybody goes except Mike and I and the actors. And then he, with the actors, we'll run it and we'll run it over and over. I mean, God that actors these days, they don't even want to be there. They want to be either in their trailers or uh, um, hanging about, you know, yabbering away somewhere else. They don't want to be there for it. Yeah, it's, to me, it's like the fundamental thing. It's all very well having standings, but standings only work to a certain extent. I like the actors there. And I'm not talking about a laborious system. In fact, I think we, there's lots of work to do, but at some stage, I want the actors there. Especially if it's tricky and they're wearing glasses, say, or something like that, where I need to see those glasses on that actor on the set, um, then I'll try and get them back in to, um, to work it through with me. But with Mike, I, I, I light it after, um, you know, say, uh, at half an hour, an hour. But before he, he goes off with the actors, we've, him and I have worked out a shot list. Uh, we've run it and we've looked at it from different positions and uh, different areas and chosen the angles we're going to shoot and then he always leaves it up to me as to because the actors are really um, completely keyed up for it on his films I mean they are totally in character um, there's never an issue about oh she needs to go first or he needs to go first or anything like that you just go on the uh, say it's daylight driven I'll go on all the ones that look towards windows or daylight first and then others I can light that are the reverses. We'll do those after. Yeah, so that yeah. Was, that, that was my question actually because there's time sensitivity in original locations, what's happening with the sun and stuff. Yeah. So you really go ahead and say this is going to be natural light because we're looking towards the windows, looking outside. And when you turn around, you're really going to relight because you're losing light and you just got to keep the, the scene going. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, we're here, we're in Europe, and uh, UK, uh, and Poland's much more settled than the UK. I've always thought it, ever since I started coming to Camry Marsh. How settled? I don't know, I'm probably talking in generality, but in UK is much more blasted by Atlantic and Arctic weather. Whereas here, I've uh, noticed it in, in Tarun, Wuch and Pidgosh, how calm the weather is. Now, I don't know whether it's like that all the time, but there, it's one minute it's sunny, and next minute it's snowing, and then it's raining, and um, it's really volatile. And, and it, it's the nightmare, the nightmare for me in working in the UK is weather. So, um, and I think that's true of all DPs, really, in their hearts. I mean, exteriors, day exteriors, yeah. At night, I don't care, it might be snowing or raining, but I'm creating the lighting from scratch. Day exteriors and, and day interiors that look out of windows at a real view, they're the worst because it's so volatile. One minute you have it and it looks great and next minute, you know, and then it's going and then it's getting dark on, say, a winter film. So it's horrible. It's not like being in California like this film the other day, Ford versus Ferrari, all shot in LA, when it, it's like dream light. Every day you wake up, it's like, you know, sunny, or there's fire, fire on the horizon. But, but uh, it's sun and it's very consistent. You can put your camera to bed at night and next morning it's the same. Well, it's not like that in Europe, is it? No, no, <laughs> definitely not, no. But uh, so that, there's this, these two basic approaches. One is to take everything away, get complete control, and there's other DPs that actually then go with that and, and flow with what's happening with the weather. What do you do? I don't know, but um, I, I don't know what I do. But I, I be, one of my favourite films is Barry Lyndon, and um, and I heard 
I heard and read about how they did Barry Lyndon. And he, when they were, they were in these big country houses and looking at vast, massive Georgian windows. And when he looked towards the windows, all the lights were turned off. There were hardly any lights in the room, uh, actually. Uh, hardly any light. In fact, there might not have been any. And he looked towards the windows, the actors, and he did it available light. All right, so they were able to choose. Um, so, so I think the, it was disciplined. They would look towards the windows when they had the light and great light, and I'm sure they waited for it. The perfect exterior view, turn over, let's run it now. I'm sure that's how that would work. And of course, it looked gorgeous with natural light, exposing for the outside and, um, and letting the light fall off into these big rooms. Fabulous. And it did look fabulous because it, I think lighting to work really well like that has to be simple. If it's being lit from windows, it has to be simple. There can't be cross light and um, you see it a lot where suddenly there's, there's light coming from where? It's, it's false. It's, it's either from a place where there isn't any window. And it immediately, uh, for me, it, it, it makes me really suspicious of the whole thing. So he would use this thing. anyway. So there we go. So we're now looking at uh, win windows. All the actors, if you watch Barry Lyndon again with, with this in mind, you'll see how fantastic it looks. And then, when, he, when they're done the looking that way, they then turned around and looked into the room this way, and outside the window would be banks and banks of um, maxi boots. Right, basically maxi boots. There was no HMIs then, that was the lighting of the day. There was arc lamps, you know, uh, but that would have looked hideous. So banks, it's a bit like using a Wendy light inside. Um, you know, multiple uh, um, on high lifts, on rollers, up you go, on, um, and, and all these lamps would come up outside the windows, banks and banks of them, and they'd just blast them in. I, I mean, yeah, I'm sure they probably had an 85 on for the, um, or an 81 EF, whatever, for the looking at the windows, and then that would come out. Now, we've, now we're shooting at 3,200, no blues or anything on the windows and uh, on the lamps and just blasting in and it looked absolutely gorgeous. So it's so simple, such a simple idea. And um, of course he, he, he's not looking um, flat into the room like that. It would be side lit from the window. Yeah, you know, it would be modeled and he had all these things. But I just, when I first read that about how they did that, it was just so beautifully simple and so organic really that there would be all these lights waiting and then have their turn and come up and then you look this way and then put them on. I, I love that. Do you, especially when simulating daylight again, do you choose different kinds of colors like there's a sky and maybe something warm coming in to get it more because natural light always has so many colors. Yeah. Do you, do you play with that kind of stuff? It depends. All right. It depends how much light I have coming in. Because sometimes, it, it, now at some stage it, during that day, it's going to turn to night. And um, well, as it does, like now, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, you're finished, aren't you, really? Three o'clock? Um, so it's better to really to have the whole scene looking in a similar way. So it might be that, um, yeah, you could say, you know, take, take say, say it's bounce light. That's a very nice way to do it. So you bounce, you you put your um, you put your your rag or whatever it is, eight by twelve by twenty by whatever, <coughs> outside a window or whatever, and you bounce off it. And then you're also gathering all the ambient light with all those different colours uh, um, that are still coming in the room. But you're now this. This of course is when you're not looking. Those, obviously, um, but then you're gathering all those the different colours of the spectrum. This is what you're saying yeah, yeah. Uh, that daylight's made up of without without blocking it. Because as soon as you put that rag um, or whatever or diffusion over the windows, you're only getting that 
big rap, a soft light, which is done to death the whole time. And so it's always a it's always a dichotomy this because it's fantastic to get. I mean, quite often, say say I'm doing a um, a, a day interior scene, and um, there's sun. There's nothing that looks like the sun. I don't give a goddamn thing what anybody says. There's nothing that looks like the sun. And and when it comes into a room and it comes across the floor, the bed, the furniture, whatever. It, over the actors, hopefully not over their faces, but um, it looks fantastic, unique. The trouble is that it goes. It's only there in that position for um, for like um, ten minutes, and then it's it's gone. So then you, but but if if I can use it, I will, and then I'll put um, like a um, a ten k or a twenty k outside there and try and simulate what I had when I had the sun but try and get the the, the say if it's a wide shot that those and, it, and and the sun is there then I'll try and use it whatever it is if it's there I'll try and use it uh, I've often come into situations where we know it's going to happen and then strike the light from the beginning so actually it's going to be that when the sun moves that's gone do you do that too or do you really yeah, no I, I do that too if I think that we've got a chance of gathering it and it's going to work for us yes but it's so fast across Be that moment uh, of it being in exactly that right position is it so you have to be you have to be ready for that but uh you know the trouble is it, you, you know okay let's do another take let's do another take let's do another take and you find the sun is like and what you had um it is gone the, the magic of it has, has disappeared so yeah it depends But that's, in a way, that's the strength of location shooting. Because some, then that sun might move around and come down a corridor. It might be through another direction which you can use. So, yeah, I mean, I think that is, things happen on a location that they never happen in the studio. Magical things happen outside windows, say trees outside, say uh, views, city views, whatever. And um, no back cloth. No trans light is anything like the real deal of having the real view, but it's not always possible. Do you then work with the staging? Do you say like, okay, the sun's going to be in here at 8 a.m. and then 3 p.m. it's going to come in here. Do you mind within the cutting of the scene if the sun has changed? Or do you then really just block it out because he started out saying no sun's here and it's going to stay here for the scene? Um, yeah, I, I, that, the answer to that is quite tricky because You could say, and people have said in the past, and I think it's very valid, that there is no such thing as lighting continuity. And I think there's a lot of strength in that. It, 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 a lot of truth in it. Because the way the way films are cut, um, you, you see it all the time. What might be there? Um, hope, you, you know, hopefully, we're not repeating that shot. That shot is for this, um, and now um, I'm the sun coming into the room. Uh, striping across the floor, magic. Well, hopefully you've got that, and then you move on. Yeah. And then I can simulate it with a 20 or a 10 or whatever, or even a, a source four, small, but very warm and um, cut like a source four, you know, scissored like a source four. Um, so I just think it's, uh, and no one's, and then you could say, well, take that same sun that you've looked at there and put it on a wall across there. Nobody ever um, thinks about it. So you could have a slash of light as if from the sun over there. And actually, when you see the scene put together and cut together, you completely relax. You might be worrying about it. Oh, God, I've got that over there for that and this over there for this. Um, oh, you know, everybody's going to notice it. But of course, nobody goddamn notices it. Anything like that when I mean, they're watching a film. You can do what you like. Is there something within that that you keep continuity, like warmth of color or contrast, or you do you just let go completely? No, I like to keep the the, the that um, the warmth of the scene or coldness of the scene the same, and um, and the contrast level the same. I don't screw around with that. If I if 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 I've got like this ambient feel. I'll try and retain that in one way or the other throughout the scene. But of course, the joys of the DI these days is that you can take contrast levels and you can open it up later. So you can 
homogenise, I, I call it, homogenise the whole a bit later and marry, marry shots together. Or you could take that slash of light and key into it and warm it a bit or cool it a bit. Um, so there are lots of tools available in the DI that help you um, that help you um, maintain uh, maintain the look throughout the scene. So we got this organic scene now shot outside. Yeah. Now let's say you're going into the studio. Do you try to maintain this organic, even if it would be so simple to get it really continuity, just to you know break it up a little bit, what looks like studio? Before I answer that, I just want to say something about what we've been talking about. That is all looking outside of windows we've been talking about, very simple really. But it's when you're outside in Europe that it, that's, that's the killer. This is the killer. It, you've got, say, a long extended scene outside and, and the weather's shit. That, this is where it all starts. It, it's like, oh my God, you know, and we had sun in the morning and then we had it raining in the afternoon. That is the nightmare. And there's no easy, there's no easy, yeah, so then you do these wide shots and this beautiful light. When you go in, you see it all the time. You go in and it's like almost dark. And, um, oh, it's horrible. It's the worst feeling in the world, I think, really. Um, oh, we've got to get it in. We've got to get it in. We're not coming back tomorrow. We've got to, sh we've got to shoot, right? And sometimes it, it's not possible. So it's better, really, to say you can't do it. Um, you can't. It won't match. Uh, and, and then if you say it won't match, of course, you, you mean it won't match. Um, you know, the director will listen up. OK, it's not just a financial question. Then. It, it's a question about, is, is it going to ruin the film? and ruin the scene and the answer is it is going to so it's better really to have a game plan for it say you did say you've got this big long extended scene you'd be better to go out two mornings in a row three mornings in a row whatever hope to god that it's going to be at least it's morning time all to be consistent it's in the afternoon things get run so it's better in a way to be out there doing that and then to go inside um, uh, in the afternoon say and carry on with what you were doing inside or whatever. If you can, so that you're not confronted with this thing of dying light and trying to get the shots in to make it all look like the same scene. That's, that's pretty the worst thing, I think, really. Do you prep in any kind of way if you have to finish the scene outside? What kind of gear you bring in, actually? you bring in lights, artificial, to work outside? Say again. When you're shooting outside the scene and you know that weather's not going to be consistent, do you have big guns with you? Do you have stuff with you to kind of fake the situation? I mean, for the close-ups later on or whatever? Yeah, on the film I did with Mike Lee and Peter Liu, um, this, this whole day took place on a scorchingly hot summer's day in 1819, whatever, um, 200 years ago. And, um, and it, we had the worst weather while we shot the film. And we were outside uh, nearly all the time for the latter part, when the um, massacre took place. And um, we had appalling weather. So th I had no choice. I mean, I don't like to. Uh, I don't like to uh, do any artificial lighting outside. But um, I do. I, 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 I mean, I have to. Um, I have, you know, I might, I might not like it, but I have an obligation to um, to carry on. It, it, there's not always you can go inside. Although on that film, on Peter Lou, we did go inside quite a lot when it was bad weather out. We had to. You couldn't shoot it if it was pouring with rain. Terrible. So, yeah, I had um, big lights. I had rows of um, of. Um, of Ari Suns, um, things like that, uh, and I was using, or um, Ari Max, 18K Ari Max. Had no choice. I had um, loads of those which I'd splatter around the ground as backlight, and then for um, frontal light, which was like horrible, non existent, dark daylight coming down, I had 20 by 20 by rags on um, condors. 
and I put those up and then blast big lamps into them across the whole of the, um, where we were shooting and um, lift them with that. So, yeah, I could say, no, I never do. Yeah. I never use artificial yeah. light outside, but it would be a complete lie. And, um, and also, say you did get that sun in the morning, and then in the afternoon, it, you could still shoot, but it was really cloudy. Then I'll put a lamp on a lift and backlight them the way they were in the morning light. Hey, you have to. Yeah. There's no way out. You have to do that. And it, it may hurt you to do it, but yeah. because that lamp doesn't really cover too much, it only covers like one or two people. And then you've got more, or you can use an Ari Sun or whatever, but Ari Suns are very expensive. And, uh, you know, this is a cost thing now, a cost issue. But um, yeah, you have to be, and the thing is, you must be ready for it. Yeah. It's not just a question of, oh my God, what am I going to do? I have to bring, um, you have to have them all ready to go. Uh, otherwise, you're, again, you're not doing your job. Yeah. That's especially for young cinematographers often an issue because you've got to prep it. And then you also got to have the boss to say, we're not using it. It's going to be fine. That's Every right. Stand by. Yeah. Yes. To do so, moving then inside, how do you how do you deal with the studio situations? Recreating the natural light you had in the scene. All right, I find studio work really easy. Okay. In comparison to location work, it's like taking candy from a baby <laughs> uh, because you've got this blank canvas. And you, if you want to put a light outside the window, you just walk out there and stick a light outside the window. Whereas on location, you might be two stories up. A big difference. So it, it's always, yeah, in a way, you, you've got to hold yourself back and, and still maintain the integrity of what you're doing because it's just too, it's, just, it's, it's like your lights around here. It's lovely, all, all easy peasy, lights around the set, bring them in, we're ready. <laughs> uh, but on, on a location, that ain't the thing. For a start, if it's pissing with rain, Right, those lamps have got to be protected. Some lamps don't like the weather. Um, the S60s and S30s, they might, um, they might be a great lamp to use, but outside when it's raining, they need to be really fully covered with, uh, with um, gel to uh, stop them from um, uh, shorting out. Uh, and there are all sorts of issues. Wind, uh, all right, okay, so we're outside, we're gonna take a, um, a lift up but they won't take that lift up if it's so many miles an hour, uh, miles an hour wind um, or kilometers per hour. I mean, they are going to say, no, we can't put it up. So what are you going to do then when, they, when the lift guy says, sorry, we've got to bring it down? Because that happens a lot. It happened to me on the last film I did where um, the, lift, um, the lift was brought down um, halfway through the night because you couldn't... Um, well, the only thing I can do is say, well, it's a... We, we can't shoot and that's it. Everybody knows it. We can't have it up there. And then is there another way you can do it? And you've just set this big scene with these lights and now you've had your major light taken away from you and it's like, can we carry on? Is there another way to do it? Which also makes, obviously makes me very unhappy. It would make anybody very unhappy. That you've you've uh, established it this way and now you, you've got to do it another way and make it up on the spur of the moment. So. Do you extend the light inside? Do you put up lights inside as well, especially in such situations? It's like it's the only option you actually have them at some point. When I'm shooting interiors on, on location, obviously, and then you have light standing outside, lighting in, you've got to bring them down. Yeah. And then the fill light, or the fill light drops at some point. Do you extend that from the inside? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, assuredly, I do. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's when this whole thing about ambient daylight. Um, and now you've got none. And, um, but if I'm coming in, yeah, hopefully we, we're, we're in a situation where you've already established it. And, um, you know, hopefully you've got the main, uh, the main shots in. This is not necessarily the case, of course, every, yeah. And, and um, but if you've established it one way, then there are ways, certainly that if it's, if you can't get anything outside, which is rare, usually you can get whatever stuff outside, but that you are in a position where you can do it internally and try and reproduce it for closer work, looking away, you know, the other one, away from the windows, whatever. Do you, do you Does that answer you? 
Yes, absolutely. Does that anticipate, uh, do you anticipate that with the staging as well? That could happen, keep them away a little bit more from the windows, so the fall off isn't that bad? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah to, um, very much so, yeah. 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 If, if it is against the windows, you better hopefully start there and, um, and get all those shots that are necessary for it. But if you then, like you and I, and you've got a window here, yeah. and it's a conversation, well, hopefully you've done all that, you know, and then if you come, come into here and the reverse, I can, um, I can artificially yeah. like that. Yeah. I can even artificially like that from the inside the window. Exactly. Not a problem. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a very simple, yeah. Um, yeah. simple example, but you can, and one does, yeah, have to um, do that. It's all about weather, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, the, the, the other day they showed um, Ford versus Ferrari, which um, looked fantastic. Um, Feed and Papa Michael did a, a, an amazing job on it. But I had a conversation with them, and he was saying that um, they shot. There's one scene where um, the father and the son are out on the racetrack, and um, and it was getting darker and darker. This is when um, they have this conversation at sunset, and the sun had gone down, and it was getting darker and darker and darker. And they were able to keep on shooting. They were shooting digitally. I don't know what camera, but they they whacked the ISO right up, and were able to shoot even when it was um, almost dark. Now, so when I was listening to him saying it, I was thinking, "Oh my God, that's fantastic!" You know, I was thinking of it from a European point of view. Uh, from um, I'm there on a really cloudy day, and it's getting dark, and you can't see anything. That really does mean you can't see it. But he actually, when I saw the film, he was talking about this brilliant sun, sort of, in Los Angeles, and the sun had set, and it, it was like something out of uh, Days of Heaven, whatever. It was this glow on their faces from the, um, the sun had already gone. And it was getting darker and darker, but the sky was completely clear. It was a Californian dusk sky, very different from a European one. And I was, I, so I was listening to him saying this and thinking, God, that's fantastic. That, that camera must be really fast. To be, you know, but he was talking about a California perspective of, of light, this wonderful dusk light with its blueness in it and against the, the warm sky ahead. And it did look fantastic, but it's a different kind of operating system that we employ in Europe. Um, so what is changing the lights outside? It's often a lot about the fill light that really just gives you away. Do you implement that? And the other question is, do you uh, work with the with the f-stop during the shot? Do you open or close it to compensate for stuff coming along? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting this because uh, there are two things on the go here. One is, it's about um, presenting the dailies to um, whoever's financing the film, the studio, if there is one, financiers, there definitely will be those, um, the producers, the director, everybody involved in the film. Now, I could leave that stuff. I could leave it alone and say, um, I would do it later, do it in the DI. But God, everybody's watching that. And say, say, so I do, I do, um, I do um, adjust the stop. I do do, I do take a Preston and um, and uh, have my, um, usually my second AC do it. Um, I do, because I don't want anything. It's like, you know, do, do I bother with the LUT on on the dailies, you know, just leave it as Rec 7 and 9 or whatever. Of course I do. I don't have anything shown on the set without the LUT. Uh, I don't want anybody to see anything that's not going to be Otherwise, people tend to fall in love with this image <laughs> and in the cutting room and then down the line, when you're in the DI, they're saying, oh, really, I quite liked it like it was. I, I quite liked it without all that on it, you know, without that lot on it, that look on it. They fall in love in the, with the avid image, so you better protect yourself. And uh, I, I find, and also, it's so ugly if it is way over or whatever, overexposed. And you haven't done a stop pull because you can later. That is the thing you can do it later. But you know it's better to do it at the time um, so that everybody is seeing it as near as damn it to what you had in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, you asked me another side of that question. 
Yeah, because I, what was the, other book? the other one was the other Racking Death Star, and yeah. the other one was how you deal with fill light in terms of when daylight breaks. Yeah, well, fill light's really tricky. Yeah. Uh, I, and um, I don't actually like using it. Uh, when I do use it, I quite often regret it. <coughs> Because it seems all right at the time. But hopefully, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, scrim it, take it down, close the doors, make it less, less and less, until it is just a feel. Um, because quite often, um, this here is a good example, really, because all that is is a, a cloth. Uh, say that was a cloth. Say you hung. A tw you, say you've got the light there like this and at the other end of this room or set you have a, a big rag and that rag is gathering all of that light there and just pushing it back without any artificial light on it yeah. you're just kicking back uh, I find that much more um, a much more organic way of filling than, uh, than putting a lamp in so very often it will be uh, muslin um, I'm, I'm, I'm bleached muslin, yeah. and uh, for, if I want it warmer or something colder, if I'm bleached, if I if I want it to be a colder look, and I just put as much as I can of this across the room, as far away from the actors as I can, just to bring it back. But of course, the other thing that I do love using, um, especially if it's a period film, is smoke. I love using smoke because that is the the most natural feel you can get. And uh, if you can get a level on the smoke, um, you don't need any fuel whatsoever. Yeah, that's, re that's really interesting. <coughs> I've seen that now for the first time actually being done. Because smoke is so tricky that you don't see it. You have to have somebody who really knows yeah, how to use it. That's right. It, it, it was Vittorio Storaro where I learned that from, basically. Because he, he, he um, uh, and remains, I'm sure he's the same now, but um, smoke was his fill. And you don't have to see that smoke. That smoke can be completely invisible. It's just like it's a, it's a, 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 a low key diffusion filter, um, not doing a lot, but it's there filling them. And you take that smoke away and see the difference in the contrast level. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was really impressed by that too. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of rags, so when you need more fill, uh, let's say it's the, the dark location, you just bring in rags and you do the same opposite too, you do negative outside, you do black. Yeah, yeah, outside and in. So a lot of black, yeah. especially above. Because um, when, when the daylight pours in or the artificial light from outside pours in, it's easy to forget the ceilings, which are invariably white or cream or, or magnolia or some form. Yeah. So I, I very often put a rag up, a black, um, a, a black dorvetine or whatever, or a blackout above the set, um, just tied up, tied up um, as simply as I can. And that makes a big difference because otherwise you're, you're, you haven't got a chance. Your set is um, the, the, um, the level that comes in off a ceiling like this one. Um, and that's only from this, like here, look at it. I mean, it's just like that. And can you imagine it um, over a large set? So I do try <coughs> and, and, and negative bounce, you know, close up the ceiling so that I haven't got that. So the only thing is the one from downstairs like this. And floors are the same. If it's a, a whitish, shiny floor, I'm putting stuff down on the floor to stop that, unless I want it. But if I don't want it, I'll put something down to uh, block it out. How much, I mean, obviously, with my view, do you, how in constraint of actors, how close do you feel comfortable bringing in gear, say, for close-ups and stuff, in terms of, you know, what the room is not like and what then happens for the close-up? Yeah, tricky. Yeah. It's tricky, that. Yeah. It all depends who the actors are and how comfortable they are with getting close-up. Because I don't really shoot much on very long lenses. A close-up for me is like a 50 or 65. That's not far away. 65 would on you for a close-up would be like this. And a 50, I'll be here on this. So, you know, we're only talk if we're talking about 100 or um, 135, we're over there. But that gives the, if I'm, I'm very, um, it's very important to me, this, of 
lenses and I, I like to shoot the scene as much as I can with one lens um, because uh, yeah I, I like the feel of if we're talking like this and um, we're having a conversation and now we're into the coverage here I don't want to be over there looking over my, my shoulder on a long lens for, I mean in a, I mean it's done all the time but to me it should be here uh, and that that's a, that's kind of a 40 really and then we're in there you know and, and 50 would be here so I feel I feel much better the actors are um, um, it's much more engaging uh, you know and believable that you know you don't really notice it but it's there that you're in the right position here here with close eye line I like very much close eye line unless there's a good reason for it I like to be right camera actor can you please lean in for me push their heads against the map box to get a tighter a tighter eye line and, and then be shooting more 40 50 rather than a longer lens or or, or god forbid you know on here on a wide lens which is not the way I shoot at all because it's also interesting what I've seen then when the movie's edited, how the room feels as a space, and if it's one lens, it's such a tight room yeah. because you understand the orientation of it. Then, if the lens jumps all the time, yeah. But I think you know what you just said is the key to it, really. Um, when say when I'm working with Mike Lee, and we um, we're in a very small um, environment, which we often are in, uh, you know, where the characters might live might be tiny tiny rooms. Uh, Vera Drake is a really good example of this. It's in a tiny, tiny apartment um, and a tiny flat at the top of the building. And um, it's really easy to make it look grand and big. All you have to do is to put an 18 mil on and go into the corner and so that you've got everybody in the frame. That's the, that's the killer. I don't think you should ever do that. You should do it with a, like a 32 or a 40 and um, then Mike has great um, uh, great fun in choreographing the actors in and out of frame on a 32 or 40 where he brings them in and then they leave he's a master at it a master of the choreography like that to the lens and he will spend quite a lot of time sitting behind the camera himself Bring them in. Why don't you go now and try? You know, and then you come in, and so you never make the room look bigger. You're sharing this issue of we can't see everything with the director, and let the director's talent and um, import uh, work for it. Let him make the choreography work on a tighter lens, and then and then the integrity of the size of the environment isn't. Um, compromised and you don't have this thing where you see it a lot where a small room is always on stage isn't it nearly invariably you're on a stage and you just go wide because you can or you knock the wall down and go back but it, it's not real it's, it, it's got a false look and the false look is you can't get back far enough to make this room look that big because the apartment should be smaller and much more intimate do you feel the same about the lighting? Like if there's a light inside a room and there should be a window outside, suddenly the room feels different in, in perspective and size? Yes. How do you deal with that? No, well, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I just like to, just for a moment, talk about a film I saw yesterday, which was a Russian film called Beanpole. And it was um, photographed by um, a, a Russian DP, a woman, and it was absolutely fantastic, fantastically photographed. So I know we got all these Hollywood films and blah, blah, blah. But here was a film. It wasn't even in competition. It's showing in the Baltic Review. But actually, it's Russia's um, submission for the, this year's Oscars. And just immaculately photographed from beginning to end. Never putting on a wide lens. Uh, you never saw the whole thing. I mean, it was so well done. You never saw the whole room. You only saw what the actors were kind of looking at from their perspective, each other, close. And it gave 
this fantastic claustrophobic feel to the film, all in tiny areas and um, small spaces, and gave the film this fabulous integrity. Um, I've not seen anything like it for a while. It was a masterwork, really, and it was all about keeping it tight and contained. Uh, um, I recommend, if you haven't seen it, I recommend this film hugely. So we talked about everybody yeah, can ask questions and then we've yeah. just been going on. Um, questions? Yeah, I have a question. Just in terms of using gates, uh, you know, in the Apple from New York, and I, I work with a couple of DPs that uh, oh, yeah. like to use haze a lot. Yeah. It's one thing on a music video where it yeah. can change, but when you're shooting all day long, yeah. do you have a technique to keep, you know, you need that consistent level especially when you want it to be just atmospheric and not like smoke, right? Do you, do you have a technique that you use to keep consistent? Close, close all the doors. <laughs> <laughs> and the goddamn windows. <laughs> and then put um, velvet over them and try and keep it in. But it, it's a real issue. I know that. It's a real issue. But uh, and, and also, the other one is, you're not allowed to put it on in the end. Uh, you get it all the time. We can't have any smoke in here. But this is water-based. I don't care. You can't use it. So yeah, sometimes I can't. And um, you know that happens. That happens a lot. You can't. I can't. Couldn't sit here and put my hand up and say it works every time. But when it does, and I can control it, and it's not all just blowing away. It's easier. It is easier on the stage, except one thing. That is, it goes straight up out of the shot. So uh, you're often forced to put something over the top to uh, to uh, keep it in the set. But um, on a real on a, a real location, I do I do try and, and then it's up to me. I'm like you know trying to control the density of it too much, too little, or whatever. Or have it on this have it like with um, this poly you know the poly tunnel thing where you've just got it coming out very small, but it's wrapping around the entire set and able to give a sort of more consistent look. And hopefully the guys who are doing it are like up, up there with me as well. It's, it's good to work with people who know that level anyway. So it is tricky, but, but um, uh, very nice to use. Light, you want light, light coming in through a window with any sort of haze, makes those lights look absolutely, you know, uh, absolutely gorgeous, you know, picked out by the light. Lots of rooms you shoot in anyway have atmosphere in them, dust, dust motes um, that are in the light, uh, which is wonderful to get. As soon as you put that haze or atmosphere in, all those come out and they're all um, they're all apparent. Whereas when you don't have any atmosphere and it's clean as custard, it, it, it it's not so evocative. Really. And you're just doing that by eye. Yeah, by eye. Oh, sometimes I'm looking at um, on the monitor as well, and have them up there side by side and say, "Oh, this is good. We'll go." But um, quite often it's by eye. I can tell through the the finder really um, where it's at, and if it's looking too um, if it's looking too smoky. Uh, that's what that uh, now then if it is looking a bit smoky, I found that in the DI, uh, yes, I don't really panic too much about. I mean, if it's really thick, it's never going to cut anyway. But if it's just a little bit here and there, it's it's quite straightforward in the DI to cut through them. It, it's great the DI, the button they use, D a D H button, the D <laughs> the D atmosphere button. They wind it down. My God, it's like you know they're cutting through a diffusion filter, which is something they can do as well, or or, or add one. But it's easier to take it away than that. Oh, does, does that answer you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it is tricky, but worthwhile. If oh, you can one, one get away. And when you're in the wide shot versus moving in for the tighter, are you? Less, less on the tighter. Sure thing, less on the tighter. You don't have to go so crazy. So it's like putting a heavier diffusion filter or the same diffusion filter you were using, if you are using diffusion, which I don't really, but you could. You could say the same if you're using an 18 mil. You need a number one, but when you go into a close-up on a 50 or whatever, you only need like a quarter. So it's the same sort of thing. You need less smoke, less atmosphere with that. Yeah. 
uh, your work with Mike Lee is fantastic, and it's uh, it, you, know, you talked a lot about the kind of pre-production process that happens during the shoot. It sounds like. Yeah. So what is the prep before the shoot look like uh, if a lot of the planning is happening on set? Uh, the prep before the shoot is pretty scratchy, really, because he didn't talk about it a lot before the shoot, because he's with the actors building their characters. That's what happens. He's, he's doing it for months, months with the actors, bringing those characters to life. Things only get going for me, really, is once we start. So, you know, I, I'll, I, I'm not, I, would, I would be lying if I, I said I didn't know anything. But I, I do know that we're going to be in this, say, theatre, like on some of the films we've done, or uh, we're going to be in this house or within you know, I know that. And I, I, I'll have prepped it as much as I possibly can. But until I've seen the scene and uh, what's in his mind's eye, um, I'm like everybody else in the company. I don't really know. So the prep, I can't really do that much prep. My prep time is kind of limited on these films because there's not a lot he can share with me because he doesn't know yet what's going to happen. He doesn't know himself until he starts making the film, which is uh, basically a couple of days before we go out and shoot it, he starts preparing the first scenes. And when they're done, he's working out the next scene. So it's like he rehearses, we shoot, he rehearses, we shoot, all the way through our schedule. We go home early, he continues rehearsing, builds a scene, and then we go back in, he shows us it, we shoot it. It's like that, organic, totally, made up, made up as we go along. How do you deal with the lighting package? I mean... I have everything on that truck. <laughs> <laughs> I have everything on that truck, everything that Hannah Lux can give me for the money. I'll, I'll, I'll be carrying a whole plethora of different ideas on that truck. Because, yeah, it's a thing, it's a big thing. I, I cannot be caught out by him suddenly turning around and saying, but it doesn't really work like that. But rather than keep on phoning um, <coughs> panel up, usually, uh, I work with them mostly, but rather than just phoning them up all the time, oh, we need this, we need that, I try and carry it. Or, as I said before to this question here, I'll have seen some of this. Most of my prep on his films is going to see locations which haven't really been chosen yet because he has to choose them, and rightly so. But I'll go and see a number of different possibilities. And um, myself and uh, the gaffer will work. If we are in here, what do we need? We'll do that on a lot of different choices of, of different locations. But if we were in here, we'd bring it like this. And so we'll have those as special packages, just like one does when you've got a big set two piece and you have to order stuff in in advance. We, that will be done. It's just I don't know what we're going to do in the in the room. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know where we're going to be, in, you know, and the environment. And I'll I'll have to, you know, um, have it in the have have it already ordered, even if we don't use it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill, are you good for Mister Turner? Uh, to develop this painterly quality, you developed, you took out Turner's paintings, picked out certain colors, and developed a lot uh, for the film. Uh, if you can, excuse me, but shed some light on the issue. I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. But I'd like my friend here to come over here immediately into Marsden. <laughs> uh, Peter, uh, Peter is a, a highly talented uh, DIT. And um, Peter helped me create the nuts um, on Turner. And um, he could just say something about this rather than me rabbiting on it. Uh, in terms of like color, we didn't like create a lot <coughs> based on the painting so much. The one thing I did sort of was more of a personal thing and it sort of helped a little bit, I guess, along the way. Um, Myself and Gordon, as a folks as well, we sort of independently researched Turner and paintings, which is obviously an easy one to do. Um, uh, sort of, you know, for about twelve months before we started, and then um, when we got into the prep, uh, oh, when I got into the prep, I sort of like 
because of the drought that that was loaded. And uh, on uh, one occasion, like, you know, obviously they were preparing paintings, and they were printing them, and they were actually painting paintings um, to make them a bit more realistic on camera. And uh, they also had like a list of the paintings. Um, it, was, it was a handwritten note. I've got, I've got a photograph of it somewhere in my. Of the colours you used. No, it was, it was well. There was we had reviewed other things, but like there was a colour palette which the Tate had, and things. But there was a handwritten note that Mike had written with a list of paintings to focus on. So I took this photograph and um, went home. In the meantime, I got the whole collection digitally of all the <coughs> paintings, um, which weren't amazingly colour matched, but a lot of them had swatches, so I could at least balance everything. I could then look at the books and cross reference. And I looked at this list and I went, well, I wonder what we can do with this list. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll just see if I can average the paintings. And uh, so I just went through that, sort of mosaic each painting. And so, you know, so it's completely blurred in a way. And just, you know, they can sort of just make out the colours of it. And Did you multiply the, the pictures on top of each other? No. I, all I ended up doing was I found a little bit of software and I just went, can you just give me 10 colours? Just pick 10 colours out of each. Um, and was, you know, in, the, in the digital world that we are, so I've got digital numbers and I just put these little swatches together and um, turn my, turn my screen to black and white, put the swatches together from the darkest to the lightest and I ended up with like a, it's like a like big Macbeth in a way, but just, um, it was sort of a, okay, maybe this is what it was and I sort of started looking at the painting and I'm like, okay, maybe this is like, a, it's just an average. Um, and I think I just, then I sort of presented it to you and I presented it to like our designer as well, Susan Davies, just said, this is sort of an idea and um, from that point, we sort of talked as well, like with Gordon as well. We were all like, well, we can see in these paintings that, you know, his. his teal. The teal was sort of popping teal out a little in the bit. Shadow areas. Shadows with teal. Yeah. And then his, his highlights were a little bit warmer. And yeah, in, in yellow, yeah. yellow in the highlights yeah. and teal in the shadows yeah. came, came out of it. Yes. And we built that into the LUT. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and uh, I sort of created a couple of LUTs, one that was sort of daytime. It was more of a technical lot, really, and a, day, a nighttime one, which we sort of switched and it was a bit more low key, and and, um, and then sort of continued that through the DI. And, but it wasn't like um, going, oh, we have to pinpoint a color precisely to it. It was more of an inspiration. Yeah, um, because yeah. the thing is, we never really, on that film, we never reproduced any turn of painting. It, 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 some, some films about painters, they are obsessed by. Um, reproducing that canvas on the screen. I mean, it's a bit hokey, really. Oh, what we wanted to do was to evoke the paintings in the general color palette of the film and the way we photographed it. So we were invoking Turner, evoking Turner, not trying to copy him. Uh, hopefully that, that integrity comes through. And that's partly my belief. You never, ever try and reproduce a Turner canvas. But we did. In, we did accidentally come quite close in a couple of places. For instance, when the the old uh, what's the name of the fight? Temeraire. Sorry, Temeraire. Yes, yeah, the temp the fighting Temeraire came up the river, and um, and um, the VFX house um, gave us a rendition of this fighting Temeraire, and it looked just like a blooming painting. It did, but uh, that it was kind of an accidental thing in the light that we were filming at sunset and all that. But we never really went for um, went for uh, reproducing turn. I think. Like, like, I think every, even when we shot it, the weather was amazing, wasn't it? Like, yeah, it was fantastic. We had the right the right sunlight for it, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Um, it's big, been a big change for me in working on the set now with light grading and having a DAT. How do the two of you plus your gap work together? And well. Uh, Gaffer not so much at the beginning. He's always doing something else. But, and Pete's often doing something else, but gives me the time at the front of a show, uh, a film, to spend time together. So uh, Peter is um, very important. His input is really important to me. Um, on Motherless Brooklyn, when I was shooting in New York, as I started prep, uh, Peter was very much involved. In, in the look I gave Motherless Brooklyn. So I, because I, obviously I was in New York working with um, complete strangers, um, nothing wrong with that, I do it all the time, but 
Peter was there back in London as a, a kind of anchor for me. And I sent him initially um, my test that I was shooting out there. And he and um, Adam Inglis, the colorist I al almost always use, and they went in together and devised LUTs out of um, the tests and sent them back, embedded in the tests. And, um, and then that was a talking point. And we, in the end, we refined it. We refined the look on a transatlantic, um, you know, um, a dialogue, I would say. So it means you don't do live grading, you define clear lots what's going to happen, and then you just switch and you work off of those. Uh, well, we, like Peter Lou, we did, and the previous films as well, done a little bit of live grading, but um, not that not much. Not that much. And, uh, I never have time for yeah, it. I can't, I can't spend the time. We've already yeah. talked about it. I've endlessly discussed it. Yeah. So I leave it to Peter to go for it. Yeah. Uh, I haven't got that time. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's fast and furious, yeah. as you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. well, I don't spend time in a tent with Peter looking at, um, at how we could grade this better. I'm relying on him to do it um, for me. Yeah, we haven't got yeah. anything. This be especially yeah. because you're operating. So yeah. you know that. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. So, you know, obviously I'm just keeping an eye on all the time. But in terms of, like, even when we did Peter Lou, like, um, my assistant, who's and she's a great git as well, and the assistant. She was um, obviously looking out for data more than anything else, but um, I would give her a couple of instructions occasionally based on what we've been looking at, or, um, and she'd just do something on the dailies, but um, that was about it, you know, just sort of kept doing, because, you know, that was the consistency part, really. Sometimes it'd be like, you know, if you do that, just add on, you know, kept it simple. Yeah. Questions? Um, yeah. If you have to go back and do pickups or something like that, which we all dread, but it happens, uh, what do you do the way of notes on the day, thinking I might have to reshoot this in three months' time? Nothing. So who does that? Does anyone do that? Nobody does it. No, I've just got it in here. <laughs> <honestly. laughs> I never forget what I've done, uh, not in terms of a lighting setup. Well, it, sometimes if it comes down to like a year later or whatever, I might get a bit woolly there, and then I. Um, I contact the, whoever the gaffer was, and um, gaffers are amazing. They're like golfers. They've got it absolutely know exactly what lamp they used on. Uh, they're like golfers going around 16 holes at Atlanta, whatever. They know um, exactly what you use, so I can tap on them for uh, what I did on the day, but very rarely I go back after that amount of time. It's more right if I'm doing an article about it and have to tell them what I used. But uh, if it's um, during the shoot, uh, and I have to go back and do pickups. Then um, I know I, I have that stop and everything. You know. I think we're over time, so uh, I'd like to. All right. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. Right yeah. I'd like to thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.